Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this event organized by the EPP Group in the European Parliament on another one of the Let's Talk series. Welcome to everyone joining us here in the audience, a very numerous audience, and also to all of you who will be following us online uh, this morning. My name is Anna Gumbau. I am a journalist based in Brussels, and I'll be your host in today's session. Today we will be presenting the book on Parliament, written by a member of the European Parliament, Paolo Rangel, who is with us today to present the book. On Parliament traces back the history of the UK Parliament, how an institution that virtually used to have no powers became one of the most powerful institutions. And which lesson can the European Parliament learn from this history? Which similarities can we find in these two parallel stories? I believe also that this book comes at a very timely moment, in my view. We are talking about, we're working towards the Europe that we want under the Conference on the Future of Europe and its follow-up. And also we are just a couple of years away of the European Parliament elections. So I believe there's a lot to be discussing, a lot of lessons that we can learn from, um, from, this, uh, from this story. And in this very sunny day in Brussels, we will have uh, Paolo Rangel to present the main findings, the main reflections also around this book. And we also have a couple more special guests, uh, with President of the European Parliament, Roberta Metzola, and Member of the European Parliament, Guy Verhofstadt. So I would like to start by giving the floor to the President of the European Parliament, Ms. Roberta Metzola. Thank you for being with us. Thank you very much, uh, querido Paolo, dear Guy, dear friends, dear distinguished guests, it is really a great pleasure for me to be here today alongside my dear friend uh, and colleague Paolo Rangel as he is presenting his new book on Parliament, his newest book on Parliament. I have quite a few of them um, that we have talked about so often over the past years. Hand in hand with an active and successful political career, both uh, at national and uh, European level, one cannot help but admire Paolo's ability to preserve his academic career, his continued commitment with the Academia Bur's testament to his determination to pushing the frontiers of our knowledge. And all of us, including the European Parliament as an institution, benefit through his continuous publications of essays and books like this one. And the book uh, on Parliament especially cannot be more opportune or timely after outlining the historical evolution of the parliamentary system in the United Kingdom. Paolo manages to establish a number of similarities with the European Parliament and our very unique institutional framework. On Parliament demonstrates in a very pragmatic way how Westminster became a pillar of uh, British democracy, strengthening its powers and prerogatives over the centuries, and sometimes even going beyond the Constitution. It refers also to the reaction, instead of revolution, of the British Parliament to the attempt of both James I and Charles I of bringing absolutism to the old Albion. From then on, the different British institutions struggled in search, and I quote, of a dominant position on the constitutional chessboard. Now, when looking into our own European reality, this observation becomes even more interesting in light of the current discussions on the Conference on the Future of Europe and the existing institutional balance between the different European institutions. A good example underlined by Paolo is, for example, the way in which the British Parliament pushed to transform the right to petition into a real right of legislative initiative. And this European Parliament also claims that right, just like ultimately any other parliament in the world. And as you can see, there are no coincidences. Paolo is the rapporteur for our Parliament's right of initiative report, which will be voted upon in June during our plenary session in Strasbourg. Like Westminster, the European Parliament has been able to maximize and stretch, and I use these words uh, as positive words, its powers, mainly since the single European Act in 1986. And we are now, and especially after the entry into force of the Treaty of Lisbon, 
a, a pivotal institution for the European project. When reading Paolo's book, particularly his last chapter, we navigate through, and I quote, the constitutional powers of uh, the European Parliament. Examples such as the rule of law conditionality mechanism and our ability to monitor, evaluate and scrutinize the recovery and resilience facility are concrete illustrations of our extended competences and powers and that, let me make it clear, if it were not for this European Parliament, they would not exist. One other in interesting concept in this book is that of plurality or diversity of our union. A diversity that realizes a unique project as heterogeneous as the European Union with unique institutions, each one of them with a specific, unique source of legitimacy. And through his book, Paolo seeks to contribute to, discussion, to the discussion on this constitutional reality, a reality which in his view explains why the parliament appears on the political stage as bearer of its own aspirations. Ladies and gentlemen, we are living in truly unprecedented times uh, with Putin's illegal invasion of, of Ukraine, with an illegal war raging on our continent. The world is watching us now more than ever before. And it is vital that we remain united with Ukraine and this people. And to reflect this unity, we cannot be afraid of reforming this constitutional reality. And this is why this parliament has called for a European convention to respond to the proposals of the conference on the future of Europe. And I'm very, very proud to share a stage during this discussion with Guy, so that we can explore ways to amend our treaties, to reinforce our democratic system, to use this in a way that we can be more effective, more assertive, and even more democratic. And this must be ultimately a common goal for all of us in this parliament that want this institution to move forward. Last word, I would like to conclude by thanking Paolo, not only for his book and for everything that it represents, but really also being a driving force in our committee for constitutional affairs dealing with these topics. Paolo doesn't know this, but when I, before I joined this parliament, I used to attend the constitutional affairs committee meetings because I like to do that uh, and really watch discussions between uh, different political group representatives on, on uh, uh, different ideas, sometimes out of the box, sometimes provocative, but that is a committee, I see Dominic here also, that really discusses things that when you go out of the room, you go, can we share them? Shall we tell anyone this? And then in the end, after a few years of hard work, they become a reality. And I am confident that Paolo, together with Guy and all of you other members and, and colleagues, visionary, uh, and pro-Europeans continue to bring your expertise and knowledge to what is ultimately our common endeavor. So, muito obrigada, Paolo. Thank you, and uh, let's enjoy the discussion. Thank you very much, President Metzola. And indeed, we cannot be afraid in the context that we are living at the moment to, to dare to, to, to be reforming our, our democratic, our constitution, uh, constitutional system towards a more strengthened democracy. So, uh, following up, I would like to give the floor to Mr. Guy Verhofstadt, member of the European Parliament, for some introductory remarks as well. Well, thank you very much. Um, uh, I think we can do it like that, yeah? So, uh, that's uh, more familiar. Uh, mm -hmm. We are in the EPP family, even when I am. <laughs> so, th thank you, thank you, Manfred. Uh, so, uh, first of all, uh, congratulations to uh, Paolo. When he asked me to introduce, uh, together with the President of the Parliament, uh, his book, 
I asked him, it's about what? It's about transnationalists, uh, Paolo? <laughs> no, 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 he said, it's not about transnationalists. <laughs> that, okay, but he announced that the next book will about, uh, be about transnationalists. Uh, so I said, uh, yes, because I think uh, the, the book, uh, I like more the, the other side of the book, the roots of Westminster democracy and the future of the European Parliament, because it's about that, uh, is uh, really coming at the, at the right moment, because we are discussing uh, a convention, uh, discussing how we can uh, yeah, increase uh, the democratic scrutiny inside our European democracy, uh, and that means automatically yeah, the, uh, the role of the European Parliament. And what is so uh, interesting in the book is he, Paolo uh, gives us an overview of this uh, Westminster Parliament, but yeah, it didn't start as, with the name Parliament. It started in the beginning of the 13th century uh, with uh, a name of the, uh, the Great Council, Magnum Concilium. It's not this council there, eh? so it's another. Eh? Uh, and this Great uh, Council, uh, what is so uh, important to underline what uh, uh, is underlined in the book got already from from the start in the 13th century uh, in the 13th century I think that's my group leader asking where I am uh, <laughs> so, uh, ask, uh, got from the beginning in the 13th century uh, the possibility to issue uh, and to discuss and to decide on taxes that was the start. So the Magnum Concilium, before it was named Parliament, that is rightly described and very interesting the, uh, in, in, in the book, was already in the beginning of the 13th century, be before it was called Parliament, the organization that decided in uh, England about the income. And I, I tell this story looking to Manfred Weber because Manfred Weber, as the head of the working group Democracy, will remember that especially that issue was until the end uh, the reason why the report on the Conference of the European Union was published so lately. Uh, because there were some members uh, in the conference uh, who didn't want to write it down, the necessity to have a European Parliament that, as every national parliament, has all budgetary rights. That means not only on expenditures, but also on the income, raising taxes on the European level. And it's only afterwards, in the 13th century, in 1248, that the Magnum Concilium became parliament. And then gradually, and that is well described in the book by Paolo, will have a right of petition, uh, later on, the possibility uh, to uh, have uh, legislative initiatives will also extend its control on the executive, what didn't, was, not, was not called the government uh, at, uh, at that time. So it started, in fact, with taxation, revenue. What is the money we give to the king uh, to go to war, to organize his administration uh, in uh, uh, in uh, the English society uh, yeah, in, the, in the medieval time. That, that is the reality. That's the start. So I, 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 I think that what we need to do, uh, Paolo, is to buy uh, 450 copies of this book uh, with mm -hmm. the Parliament and to send it to every member of the conference, the fastest as possible, so that they can see why it is necessary that in the conclusions of the conference we want also to talk about uh, the budgetary role, the budgetary rights uh, of, of Parliament, because a Parliament starts with that. And so I think we have still an important uh, way to go with the European Parliament. That is the, the conclusion of this book. We are not there. We could have been there if uh, the French have not voted against uh, the first try to have a constitution uh, in 1954 in their French National Assembly. Because in the first uh, draft of the Constitution in 1954 uh, of uh, von Brantano and, and, and other uh, important leaders, there was foreseen that there was a European Parliament already, uh, directly elected, uh, with uh, also the power on taxation and income. 
But unfortunately, it can happen in the French National Assembly. They voted, in fact, that constitution down, not the first time, uh, by uh, the way, in, 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 45, uh, in, uh, in 54. And, and, and that meant the end. And we had to wait until uh, Spinelli in 1979 before we got the European Parliament. So we are still not there. This book of Paolo is a reminder that we need to, in the coming years, to do our utmost to have also the question of income taxation on the table as a competence of the European Parliament, as it is the case for every parliament in every country worldwide. Uh, and uh, what it shows also that th this can happen gradually. Huh? That is that uh, a, a parliament is not from day one uh, a certain um, organization directly elected with some powers. No, it's, it evolves in the time. That's also the case for, for the European Parliament. The European Parliament is today a very different animal, I should say, than it was in 1979. But it needs to go further. That's the lesson of the book. And we have an opportunity to do that. The opportunity is uh, the convention. We were asking for, for 40, uh, based on Article 48. I don't know if we have to send that also to the, to the members of the council uh, immediately. I think that we need to do it because it will remember that, that, that this is a fundamental issue that we have uh, uh, to discuss uh, in the coming years. And I am very grateful uh, to Paolo for his uh, important uh, contribution. There was no better timing to issue this book than today. And the fact that we compare it to the British that's, I think, also uh, 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 a, a good way uh, uh, to do it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. And congratulations, Bob. Thank you very much. I think it's clear that we are still on this journey and that this book gives us many keys on, on how to navigate this journey and how we can indeed uh, go further. So I guess there's no better way to, you know, uh, un understand better uh, where the book comes from and like what were the main findings than talking with the author of the book. Uh, we have uh, Mr. Pablo Rangel with us. Uh, why the UK Parliament? What prompted you to, to write the book? Well, uh, first let me thank, starting to thank to our president, Roberta Metzola, and a, a dear friend uh, 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 for this uh, uh, availability to be here today, and also to give her a start uh, uh, in these debates that you were uh, uh, quoting from AFCO. I always learned a lot uh, with Gifer of Stadt. Also uh, disagreed a lot, uh, special on transnational lists. But, uh, <laughs> but the truth is that uh, uh, there is a spirit uh, of learning there uh, that is really very, uh, 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 I'd say, productive and very constructive. And so uh, 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 that's why uh, uh, I, I thought that Guy would be the perfect person to be here with our president to present this book. Then, uh, uh, naturally, I'd like to thank uh, the presence of uh, all of you. And I thank, uh, well, in a very special way, to uh, uh, the Portuguese repair, uh, Pedro Lorti, that in a certain way represents here the council. <laughs> so they are starting. The <laughs> and and uh, my, uh, uh, sh the chairman of my group, uh, Manfred Weber, uh, that also is a very dear friend. Uh, and uh, 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 greeting them, I'm greeting all of you, all the members, all the, the assistants from members, all the staff uh, from EPP and from the parliament, and also some former members of staff that were very kind to be here today, and that uh, uh, I have learned a lot with them, and so for me it's, uh, it means really a lot. Uh, uh, and uh, 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 this being uh, done, this, I say, gratitude moment, <laughs> uh, I'd like only to, to stress or underline two or three things in a certain way, uh, having already a dialogue with uh, uh, the two, uh, with, both with uh, uh, Roberta and, and Guy. First, uh, I'd like to say that uh, it is true 
that the name of the parliament uh, after Magna Carta uh, and even a bit before it was Great Council. But before that, even before the Norman conquer of uh, Britain, uh, so in the Anglo-Saxon times, the, the, the name was Vitana Gemot or Uitana Gemot. And this, this, this means the, the council of wise people. I would say wise men, but as Francis is here, I would say wise people. <laughs> uh, and and, and, uh, and uh, Vitana comes from German Wissen. And wise is, has the same origin of Wissen. And by the way, witness in English, that is the, 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 the person that can see, uh, that sees the things. And that comes from Latin, from video. So it's very, a, a very, I'd say, a very, very European concept because it comes from Latin, but it has also roots in German. Uh, that is video, wissen. Uh, so to know in German is to see in Latin because the ones that see are the ones that know. And this was the counsel of these wise people. And so that is an invitation for Parliament in this very moment that we are uh, willing to trigger Article 48 and to uh, create the conditions to have a convention, that we have to be very wise. Uh, uh, and if we are very wise, I think that we will convince the Council to, to, to go forward with the convention. And uh, that would be my first statement. And the second is uh, uh, related to this uh, idea that is very present in the, in the, in the, the book, that is, the, 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 the British Revolution that took place in 1688, that means 100 years before the French Revolution, was not a revolution, but a reaction. It was in this uh, struggle, in this fight between the progressives that were absolutists and the conservatives that wanted to keep the powers of the parliament, it was the conservative uh, side that won. And this is only to say that this prerogative of the parliament of creating and issuing taxes was not only of British parliament. In the uh, 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 12th, 13th century, 14th century, it was of uh, Portuguese and Castilian Cortes, of all the diets, uh, what we call in German tag, uh, 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 across the different, uh, I'd say, German monarchies and, uh, and, uh, and uh, also uh, in France. So all the parliaments used to have this power. But then in the continent, as the absolutists won, then the parliament was extinguished. And so we lost this power. But in Britain, as the conservatives in this civil war of the 17th century managed to win at the uh, very end of the century, then they kept the powers that they had from the Middle Ages. And so only to say this is not a British thing. If you look at uh, Bula Aurea from Andrew II of Hungary, by the way, uh, 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 at those times Hungary was the front runner of uh, freedoms <laughs> and liberties, uh, it, it has already these kind of prerogatives and uh, uh, all across Europe. So this is an European, European uh, tradition and an European heritage and we are the ones that have the responsibility to restore uh, at the European level this, this capacity. Uh, and so these would be my two uh, main uh, 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 remarks. With the last one that, by the way, President uh, Roberta Metzola has also stressed in a quite, uh, I'd say, vocal way, that is, British Parliament was always very, very courageous trying to stretch, to push, to extend all the powers that they had and to use them to persuade or even to oblige the king to acknowledge their own powers. And that's what we have to do. We have done that with the president of the commission vote when he say you have here an agenda and only if you accept this agenda and you commit to implement it, we will vote for you. We have made this also with the conditionality in the case of uh, Next Generation EU. We are going, we are going to give a, a vote in favor, but then we need conditionality. And this is the way that we should also move. 
It's also by treaty change, surely, but also for using our competences and prerogatives to enlarge or at least to give, I'd say, the right interpretation to the treaties. Because after Lisbon, the European Parliament should have been the most powerful institution, uh, the, the ones that really uh, won power after the Lisbon Treaty. But this is true. The Council tried to do a radical interpretation of every article where they have some competence and power because they were a bit afraid of what could happen with Commission and Parliament if they had, I'd say, the common sense interpretation of the treaties. And so it's now our task to also do these two, I'd say, we have to, to, to battle and to fight in two different fields. One is treaty change, but the other is the day-to-day uh, uh, I'd say, uh, uh, work of trying to give to the treaties the proper reading, the proper interpretation where the institution that has the democratic direct legitimacy should have a central role. And so this is my three remarks on this issue. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Rangel. Um, I would like to maybe pick up on, on this uh, very last point on how, you know, with, within the treaties and within the parliaments day to day work, can we make the most use of the, of the powers that we have? And I think it would be interesting to have the take of, of uh, President Metzola and Mr. Verhofstadt if you would like to, to respond to that. Well, perhaps, perhaps a few words uh, from, from, from my end to, to just, as you said, pick up from what Paolo, where he just ended. Because I think that on the one hand, yes, we need to look at where things can be improved. Yes, we need to see uh, from, uh, as I mentioned in my speech, from a defense perspective, is uh, uh, the current institutional framework, the current treaty language allowing us to do what not only we need to do, but what we have done over the past uh, three months, even though uh, we have used, let's say, several reasons not to do it in the past. Uh, similarly, uh, on health, uh, s during the pandemic, uh, we have, let's say, discovered powers, either that we didn't know we have, or that we simply gave to ourselves. So in this uh, treaty um, uh, look, and the fact that this parliament is pushing, uh, and is the institution that will trigger that, that look to be seen, uh, it is something that we need to, to really, really examine. Uh, it's not only about the language, but it's also about the political will of the European Union to act. Uh, Guy, you mentioned uh, Manfred's uh, working group on democracy. This was one of the first conversations that, that took place, I remember, one of the first meetings. Like, what do we mean by democracy and why is uh, it important in that context that it was uh, the parliament leading the discussions? Because that has to be uh, the position that this parliament has to take during the convention and when presenting our asks before the other institutions. Uh, and they are asks that will not, uh, let's say, uh, be without negotiations. Uh, I think uh, they are asks that uh, really should be the bottom-up approach of what citizens want from us. Uh, I would rather not have, uh, uh, let's say, a debate of who wants uh, which word to be in and which word to be out but more about where can there be more Europe rather than can be less Europe. But here, I will also use uh, a personal experience from 20 years ago where, you know, with a huge uh, enthusiasm, uh, we were part of the negotiations of the Constitution, where we really looked at this project as, as, as something phenomenal and, uh, phenomenal and revolutionary. And I remember thinking, how amazing that the word solidarity is in the chapter of justice and home affairs and how there's no unanimity on migration. There's no unanimity, which means that there are countries around the table, all of them, all of them, that agree that in the area of justice and home affairs, solidarity needs to be shown. Now I look back and I say I was naive because whenever we talk about the emergency break or the possi possi possibility for one government to stop things from going further, that has been used at every single instance in order to try to circumvent qualified majority. So I think going forward in what we want as a parliament to do, 
looking at what we've done over the past years in terms of pushing the boundaries of where consensus can be found, but also where sometimes there was a veto when you should not have had a veto, is something that we all have to put, I think, our uh, national governments on the spot on. And I think this is important because the citizens in 2024, we are up for election. So 2024, they're going to say, what have you done? In 2019, uh, out of 28 member states, 26 had migration at the top. Uh, the exceptions were UK and Ireland because Brexit was the top concern there. We need to look back and say, listen, have we managed to make the advances that we needed to do? Because we promised that. And when people look to the European Union and they look to the European Parliament, they say, OK, on climate, have we been ambitious enough? Have we started to look at energy as uh, what we have always seen it as something political? And that, that when we are currently discussing our climate ambitions, it's also about security. And it's also about being innovative and not, being, not having the environment and the economy as being uh, mutually exclusive. I think this parliament can, can push forward that argument and that can be done within the context of the convention in order for us in 2024 to say we have recognized that the citizens want from us to act on this. It is not about us telling them we think you should think this, but rather than we heard you multiple times in some countries uh, successes were registered in terms of uh, who, how many people voted for the European Parliament, but in some countries less. And I think if we manage to bridge that with how we approach the convention with a bottom-up approach, but a realistic improvement of where this parliament can be the leader and finds its pro-European um, convergence of what can be done at an institutional level, I think we can really say and look back as this having been the perfect opportunity uh, to, that we seize the moment and delivered on it. And I think this also brings the notion of, of trust from citizens, which I believe that we can uh, get back to it later in, in the discussion if we have a little time. Uh, Mr. Verhofstadt, would you like to react to it also? Yeah, I was looking to uh, what British King, uh, uh, King was uh, decapitated and killed uh, uh, by Parliament and uh, it was uh, because you asked me uh, what need Parliament to do. Eh? Uh, <laughs> uh, I think I, it was Charles I, Charles I, Charles the first? Is it Charles the first? Charles the first, yes. first yeah. Uh, I was looking into the book. So, uh, I, 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 don't, I don't want to ask who would be the king no, 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 in, in no, this but, picture. You, you, the, the, <laughs> because we are saying, yeah, this in a, the, 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 the book is in fact about how at a certain moment, yeah, uh, the Parliament uh, yeah, killed their own king to have the power as they have uh, today. So I don't now propose that Charlie Michel is decapitated or what. So don't 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 write that in in in, in your articles. But uh, what what I mean is you need uh, at a certain moment, uh, I think, uh, with the European Parliament to go to the ultimate. Uh, the, the, the ultimate fight uh, to have a, a full-fledged uh, European democracy uh, in, 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 uh, in Europe. Uh, and that is, uh, like I said, not by uh, decapitating uh, somebody, but you, you have uh, an, an important weapon for that, and the Parliament has uh, budgetary, the budget, uh, the expenditures. Uh, and um, many uh, of the, the, the member states uh, need that budget. Uh, many of the member states need also next uh, generation EU fund that is also under control, uh, partially of the of the parliament. So it's, uh, it, it, in my opinion, uh, if we want to make progress, we have to have the guts to use that budgetary right that we have already today, and not to look too much into the budget in in, in budgetary lines, uh, uh, cohesion funds there, agriculture there, but the global picture. Uh, and to use uh, our budgetary rights in, in the global fight uh, on, 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 on the powers of the parliament. Uh, and and uh, so that's a little bit a modern version of, uh, of, of, of what happened in the, in the 17th century in, uh, uh, in Britain. Mm. I believe that President Metzola will need to, to go. No, no. Uh, may, may I? Uh, oh, Definitely. Oh, yes. Please. So I'll be very brief because I think that now we are running out of time, so we should close. But before mm -hmm. that, only to precise that Charles I was really decapitated in uh, 1649. But 
the result of this was a dictatorship uh, of Cromwell, and not really, uh, that, that also tells also us. And so the parliament restored <laughs> the monarchy with his son, Charles II, in yep. uh, 60, 60, uh, 1660, uh, 11 years after. And this is important also to see. We need balance of powers. So we don't need, sometimes we demonize the council uh, and the European Council, and, and, but we need also this, this, this relationship. So uh, the problem is that the council should also not be a dictator, that is. <laughs> so mm -hmm. both should be there to understand this. And then uh, I would uh, uh, close this, and I would invite all of you to have a port wine glass, because as you know, I mm -hmm. come from Porto, and so mm -hmm. this is our major, uh, uh, I'd say, symbol. Uh, and, and so if you want an aperitif before lunch, you have now the great opportunity <laughs> that is, I'm sure, better than the book of tasting port wine. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. We need to conclude the session, not the least because we have uh, some glasses of port waiting for us. But thank you very much to President Metzola, to uh, Mr. Rangel and to Mr. Verhofstadt for joining the discussion, to all of you joining us in person online and see you at the next event.